For the past eight years, there has been a net exodus of landlords from the private rental market. Tighter regulations, tax changes, and now the double whammy of inflation and rising interest rates is leading to a shortage of rental properties, just as the market needs more. In the past 20 years, the number of households in the private rented sector in England has more than doubled, from 2 million to over 4 million. So why are landlords fed up for private rental market at a time of rapidly rising demand and higher rents? Have recent regulations and proposed new laws gone too far? And does more need to be done to improve the supply of rented accommodation? According to Hamptons, in 2022, landlords sold 35,000 more properties than they bought. Landlords accounted for 12% of purchases and 16% of sales. The National Residential Landlords Association claimed that landlord confidence has plummeted this year, with landlords citing short-term pressures of higher interest rates and inflation, and also the proposed new legislation. The interest rate is so high that the rent coming in from the government, which is 475, is less than I'm having to pay the Building Society for the next two years. So I'm, if I'm Joe Average Landlord, uh, in a very short time, I'll have to hand the keys back. The private rental sector is just going to shrink so much. Back in 2014, George Osborne introduced changes to reduce tax privileges enjoyed by buy-to-let investors. This included reducing tax relief on buy-to-let mortgages and a new stamp duty surcharge on buying additional properties. And since 2014, we can see a trend to landlords selling more than buying. However, it is a new proposed legislation which is causing many landlords to think twice about the sector. This year, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up, plans to strengthen tenants' rights with greater regulation, including scrapping Section 21 no-fault evictions. For landlords, this is a major change in the market. Landlords claim that Section 21 evictions are primarily used to evict tenants who have stopped paying rent. Now, on the other hand, pressure groups for renters claim that they can be misused to unfairly evict tenants. Also, another proposed change is the end of fixed term contracts, which give tenants the right to leave after a short time. But this could cause a loss for landlords who incur the costs of marketing, inventory, paperwork, letting fees, but are then soon left without paying tenants. On top of this, there are more regulations surrounding the rental market. Now, each legislation on its own has a logic and reason for improving conditions of housing. But in a time of high inflation, meeting these criteria can be increasingly costly. For example, by 2025, landlords will have to meet an energy grade of C before they can let out their homes or face a £30,000 fine. However, nearly 56% of UK homes do not yet meet this criteria. And for landlords with old Victorian housing, the cost of renovation may make it unprofitable to lend. And some landlords claim that on all these regulations is a sign they're facing a war of attrition, with new legislation effectively bringing in rent control by the back door. It doesn't help that nationally, landlords don't have the best of reputations. Politically, there are relatively few votes in supporting landlord interests. And it is, to some extent, understandable. There's considerable sympathy for renters who are facing really great financial pressures. Those on low incomes in expensive areas are facing rent as a share of income, reaching over 50%. And this is a situation exacerbated by falling real wages and high inflation. But these same costs of living pressures are also making the industry less attractive to landlords. 80% of landlords say inflation has significantly increased the cost of maintenance, which is another cost reducing the profitability of the sector. And also, as well as high maintenance costs, inflation is reducing the real value of houses as well. Other costs and regulations brought in in recent years include deposit protection schemes, mortgage interest rate disallowance, removal of wear and tear allowance, stricter energy performances and HEMO licenses. 
and coming soon will be the removal of fixed term tenancies, removal of section 21 notices and enabling tenants to keep pets. It's a lot of changes that landlords have to absorb. The new regulations and tax changes all do have a logic and could benefit the rental sector in the long term by raising standards. But the problem is that if landlords face higher costs and more regulations, it can have the unintended effect of reducing supply. And this will affect renters as much as landlords. Given the rising costs, many landlords have a financial pressure to increase rents or even sell. And for landlords considering selling, past and future legislation is one of the biggest reasons given. Another concern about the private rented sector is that it is dominated by older generation of landlords. Over 60% of landlords are over 55 years old. And it is striking how many landlords view becoming a landlord as a good investment for a pension. Now, despite some high profile young landlord influencers on TikTok and the like, young landlords are generally not replacing the ageing profile. For many young potential landlords, the difficulties of getting on the property ladder are just as hard as for first time buyers because of high prices and cost of living pressures. All these difficult circumstances of buy to let market have been exacerbated by rising interest rates. Around 59% of landlords have at least one property financed by a buy to let mortgage. For landlords with an interest only mortgage, the effect of rising interest rates are much more of a burden than a conventional repayment mortgage. For example, supposing that we increase interest rates from 2% to 5%, the monthly mortgage payment on an interest only mortgage rises 149%, but only 38% for a standard repayment mortgage. According to the National Residential Landlords Association, if base rates rose to 5%, half of landlords claim it would make it unprofitable. The business model for many of the past 13 years has been premised on ultra low interest rates and it is a shock they have increased so much. The big question of course, how long they will stay high, but that's a question for another video. Landlords are stress test to make sure that rental incomes are at least 125% higher than their mortgage payments. So rising interest rates means rents will have to rise so they can continue to meet these stress tests. And it is unsurprising that we are seeing record rises in rents because landlords want to meet costs and maintain their profit margin of their business model. Yet overall, we can see that rental yields are actually lower than previous decades. Another aspect of a buy to let market is capital gains. In the past decade, capital gains was the most profitable part of the business. Hampton's report, the average landlord in England and Wales, sold their buy to let last year for £91,000 more than they paid for it, having owned the property for an average of less than 10 years. After the payments of capital gains tax, stamp duty and income tax, the average high rate tax paying landlord made a total net return of £100,000 or 56% over 10 years. And this represents a very good return on the initial investment. 39% of this total gain came from rental income, with 61% from capital growth. And this shows that in a booming property market, buy to let can be a very good investment. However, with house prices having temporarily peaked, the scope for large capital gains seems to be a long way off. House price to rents are at record highs, and as we have seen in previous videos, house price to income ratios are also close to all time highs. The last time we had price to income ratios of close to nine was back in the 19th century. So combined with rising interest rates, weak economic growth, house prices have started to fall. And the confidence of landlords has probably not been helped with uh, YouTubers making videos about the prospect of house price falls. But the point is, if you're looking to buy to let, you're not going to see the same capital gains in the next few years as we saw in recent decades. And for many, it might be a good time to get out of the market whilst prices are high. The average higher rate taxpayer landlord in Great Britain made around £41,000 in profit from rental income on one property over the last 10 years. Meanwhile, the average lower rate taxpayer made around £66,000 profit. 
if it wasn't for capital gains tax providing an incentive to hold on to property, more landlords may take the opportunity to sell now. But if there were plans to increase capital gains tax further, the National Residential Landlords Association claim up to 50% would consider selling. Now, of course, it's worth bearing in mind that the private rented sector has a huge range of landlords. These vary from big companies and wealthy individuals who buy with cash and are not affected by interest rates. It also includes smaller landlords who do buy on a mortgage. And the huge range of tenants and landlords means it is possible to find innumerable examples of nightmare tenants, slum landlords. But of course, on the other side of the coin, there's good tenants and good landlords. We can always pick and choose different examples. But I think it's fair to say landlords definitely do suffer from generally a poor reputation. Perhaps the idea of earning passive income from wealth has never sat easy with many. Although, of course, many landlords will say it is a mistake to think of letting as passive income. In fact, it can become a full-time job improving and managing properties. But what is clear in the short term, at least, is that there's a wide range of pressures on landlords, but are leading to a shortage of lets just at a time when we need more rental properties. This is bad news for both landlords and also renters. Solutions to this issue could involve government subsidy for home insulation. It's a social benefit which will benefit the whole economy and there's a good justification for governments taking part of that. Secondly, there does need to be a fair mechanism to uh, deal with non-paying uh, renters, which doesn't involve a very long protracted procedure in the court process, a, a procedure that's fair both to renters and to landlords. And if there is insufficient private rented accommodation, in the long term, the government needs to look at getting more interventionist in building uh, houses for rent. On a personal level, I rented for several years before buying. One landlord kicked me out a few days before Christmas. The next landlord was great. Five happy years, no complaints. I also have some experience with being a landlord myself, at least letting out a room to a lodger. All I can say is that I know what it is like to have a tenant who don't want to pay even when they can. If you like this video, uh, please give it a thumbs up, 